Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns and McDonnell, with additional financial support from Swope Community Enterprises, and by Coming up on this week's local show, the new face of libraries in our metro. A newsmaker interview with the provocative superintendent, independent school district head Jim Hinson. We invite you to come dancing with City in Motion. And meet some young entrepreneurs inventing the next big thing. Principal funding for the local show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members. Thank you. show. I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Nick Haynes. It's great to be with you. How much thought do you give to the design of your local library? All right, let's back up. When's the last time you even went to your local library? Worried about declining attendance, the Mid-Continent Public Library System is reinventing what your neighborhood library looks like and offers. At its newest branch called Woodneath, near Fast Growing Liberty, an 1850s historic home is being repurposed as a writing lab and self-publishing center for future J.K. Rowlings. The house is just part of the new project. Library Director Steve Potter took Nick on a hard hat tour of the library, which is scheduled to open this summer. Steve, how did you pick this location for this library? You know, there's a lot of serendipity that happens in the library world, and certainly that was the case here. The Crouch family that owned this property and had owned this property for over 100 years uh, contacted one of our board members, and after you know, three years or so and a lot of negotiations, we were able to acquire the property uh, for, for the library's purposes. And this is highly unusual, though, that you would see. This is an 1850s uh, yeah. antebellum home right. Right. right next to a brand new, state-of-the-art, modern-style uh -huh. library. What's actually going to happen in this space. As you come here with your story or your idea, and it might be a short story, let's say it's a short story, and we'll have staff here that will help you improve it to uh, work on the grammar, to work on story arcs, character development, all of those sorts of things. We'll have a machine here that will allow you to publish it and print it and have a hard copy that you can take home. Uh, we will also uh, have the ability to turn it into an ebook. We'll also have the ability to turn it into maybe a short movie. So you come here with your story idea and then we help you to share it to the world. These two rooms will be yes. part of the story sharing area and there'll be big French doors that will allow them mm -hmm. to be se sealed off. Now this particular room is the one that we're going to make into the study in the traditional library with the first edition books. This, this requires a little bit of work. This requires an awful lot of work. The engineers say only has five pounds of square foot load. So we typically don't let people in oh, here. Oh, so you don't want me walking Please in don't. here, Steve. <laughs> right, no. right. Okay. Not a good idea. This would be the place where the people would bring their short stories from upstairs yep. into this space. And th this is where they would turn it into a digital format because everything upstairs is digital. At a time when uh, so many libraries, even in our own metropolitan area, are cutting back Right. Some have been considering closing library branches that you are looking at, you know, and are building such a, an amazing new facility here. How were you able to make this happen, Steve? That I have a very supportive board that understands that the 20th century library is not going to be the thing that people in the 21st century need. Now, you said, Steve, that there were services mm -hmm. at this library you don't see at other libraries. Right. Like what? Well, one of the things that we've done in this library is that we've worked really hard at creating deliberate spaces uh, for specific uses. You know, I'm kind of struck, Steve, that this yes. is absolutely a humongous space, and this is not your main library branch. Right. Do you need a library this big? Would you imagine that 10 years from now there won't be even any books in a library? Oh, no, there'll still be books in a library. It's just that they, they won't be the same sorts of books or the, to the same degree that we've seen in the past. 
Now, many people, just like me, uh, like to use um, audio books right, and right. e-books to right. get their materials, right. not the old print edition of mm -hmm, the book. Mm -hmm. But that's become a challenge too. E-books, a lot of Absolutely. the big publishers are not even allowing libraries today to get that material, are they? Four of the big six will not sell directly to libraries. And the two that do sell to libraries put um, put certain restrictions on our purchase that we're not used to seeing. So why is that? Well, I, I, personally, I think that there's an, a misunderstanding about the new technology. I mean, people are, are kind of misjudging this and thinking about this still in terms of a physical book. It's not a physical book, it's bits and bytes. And we have to rethink uh, our approach to our content and the publishers need to start rethinking their approach to content in order for us to really make, uh, to make some serious headway. But when people have all of these digital <laughs> devices, as we mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. uh, some people would say, is there a future for libraries? Of course. What does Steve Potter say? Of course, there's a huge future for libraries because it's not really about the container, it's about the content. And that's always been the issue. Where are you gonna get great content? I think what we're discovering is that people, people like the idea of being able to start a book at home, turn it into an audio book and listen to it on their drive, then read another chapter over lunch, and then an audio book again on their way home. They like that. And where you can get that content, at least for the foreseeable future, is gonna be the library. Not everyone's gonna be able to afford to buy all of that content themselves. Now, many people are not always familiar, and I have to always point this out, with mm -hmm. the Mid-Continent mm -hmm. Public Library System. Mm -hmm. You've got more than 30 branches. 30 branches, right. And you also have what is the, uh, the a huge genealogy center yes. in Independence right. that not everybody is familiar with, even though you're getting huge props on a national basis That's true. as one of the top genealogy centers in the country. That is correct. We have the, you know, by, by many measures, we have the largest public genealogy library in the United States. You can go in with just basic information about your paternal grandparents and maternal grandparents, and those folks can search you all the way back to when your people came across the pond. And so it, it's pretty exciting stuff. Well, Steve, thank you very much for sure. being with us. You're Appreciate welcome. It. Thank you. Should you be required to live where you work? Well, the independent school district thinks so. A new residency rule is shaking up their top staff. About 60 principals, assistant principals, and other independent school district administrators who live outside the district are now going to have to start house hunting, Randy. A policy just passed by the school board forces administrators to live in the district by February 2015. The idea was insisted upon by Superintendent Dr. Jim Hinson, but why? It's just one of the headline grabbing stories that puts Hinson in the news of late. He's also seen himself on the Today Show and Good Morning America in the last several weeks as the district opts to enroll more than a dozen of its most obese students in a $28,000 a semester weight loss camp in South Carolina. Dr. Hinson is with us next on The Local Show. Well, we've been hearing then about this residency requirement, but of all of the things that are happening in education, all of the issues and problems that you have in that big school district, why did you pick this one to get involved with, Dr. Hinson? When we looked at our administrative staff and realized the vast majority did not live in our community, and at some levels it was really stark to look at, at our high school principals, for example, one one of the eight actually lives in our school district and so um, the school board of education was hearing from the community you know th this is a concern we're not seeing these individuals in the community they're, they're driving into the community they're driving out of the community and so it's been a long discussion uh, certainly we didn't make the decision in haste really wanting uh, exceptional leaders that we have in our buildings to be uh, more intricately involved in our community as well now the fact that they're not living in the school district and i saw some of the studies they're saying that two-thirds of those administrators principals assistant principals don't live there mm -hmm. Is not saying to you that they, they're not wanting to be in independence? Aren't you worried that uh, now by having this policy that you will have this brain drain, all of these people are going to be leaving, Dr. Hanson? You know, we're not worried about that because for the last three years we've had a residency requirement for our new administrators. And so we've been able to watch the, the pool of candidates, if you will, with the knowledge that they're going to have to live in the school district. That's a great pool of candidates. We've been able to hire some outstanding individuals already knowing they have the residency requirement. And so there are exemptions. Uh, they're allowed for individuals. 
Uh, we know that there are some family issues that are going to cause people to have to stay where they reside. We understand that. And so we've had several folks approach us already to say, okay, here's my individual situation. Here's how it impacts my family. Those individuals are granted exemptions. So uh, we want them to live there, but at the same time, uh, there are some circumstances that we will grant exemptions because of things that are going on in their individual lives. How do you think, though, this is going to do anything to improve the education in any way of the students in the independent school district? You know, we really try to be very deliberate by talking to our community and talking to principals that reside in the school district currently and those that do not, uh, asking for input and opinions. Uh, our community um, is very emphatic that they want the administrators to live in the school district so that they can be involved in community activities as well, not just leading the school but to see them at the farmer's market or the youth ball games or, or concerts or, or wherever it might be. And so we've heard loud and clear from our community about the issue. Um, certainly we've heard uh, from our administrators that already live in the district of why they think it's important to be an effective principal to live in the community. What has been the reaction to this? Now I, I'm assuming there must be some people, some of these administrators, assistant principals, principals, who are like horrified by this. I, I'm gonna now have yeah. to try and sell my house. This is a, a terrible economy. This is a very tough time time, Dr. Hinson, mm -hmm. to try and sell a house, isn't it? Well, they're, they're, they weren't surprised, so they were part of the process. Okay. And so we asked them for input into the regulation. And so we gave them a sample um, regulation, talked to us about this, how does it impact to you, how does it impact you? Gave it to them a year in advance. And so they've known that this was in discussion. At the same time, they're not required to move into the district until the 2015-2016 school year. So they still have two more years to make that transition. Um, I had an individual in my office today and she was explaining her story. Um, it's a financial hardship because of some difficulties in the family they're going through. We understand those situations are gonna work with those individuals. So, so you haven't had big boxes of Kleenex on your desk? Uh, I haven't had big boxes of Kleenex. Again, it wasn't a shock. They, they knew that this was coming. They were a part of the process. Now, we've been seeing you, though, not just in the media locally, but you've been on the Today Show recently and also on Good Morning America. Take a look. And we're back at 839 this morning on New Year, New You. We are wrapping up our week-long look at some inspiring weight loss stories. This morning, a group of students in Independence, Missouri, who through their school lost more than 750 pounds. Jason Alexander, Chelsea Neely, and Cameron Larkin are all from Independence, Missouri. And they all just got back from a semester at Mindstream Academy, a special boarding school in Bluffton, South Carolina for overweight middle and high school students. My heaviest was... 330 pounds. If you're big, you know, you usually get teased. Oh, you're fatty. It really brings you down. Jason, Chelsea, and Cameron were part of a dozen students whose nearly $29,000 tuition was paid for by the independent school district. We as a school district can take advantage of an opportunity uh, for students and their families to change the course of their life then that's what we're going to do. In December, they returned to Missouri after losing a combined 756 pounds, an emotional homecoming. He has changed so much. He's so skinny. So you have then, Dr. Hinson, had 13 of your students go to a camp in South Carolina where the tuition fee has been $28,000 a year. Why? We as a school district have tried to be very diligent in looking at the health and wellness issues of, of our students. We understand that there are some very dramatic cases in our school district that the uh, lifetime expectancy of some of our students is being altered by the health issues going on in their lives. We've had a long-standing relationship with uh, Dr. David Katz and Yale University in relation to health and wellness, early education, a number of issues. And so Dr. Katz encouraged us to go to South Carolina to look at this very unique program, which we did. And so what we've done is uh, we're the conduit for families. We uh, notified individuals as recommended to us by some of our staff that were at the 98th percentile or higher of above a healthy weight that this was an opportunity that would be available to them. And so Mindstream staff met with these families, family self-selected. They said, we want to go or, or we don't want to go. And so it's a major commitment, not only financially for them, but also to say to their kids, okay, you're off for the semester. Some of these in high school, some actually in middle school as well. We felt we had to do that as a school district because we couldn't sit by and allow kids to have major life issues and maybe their life be shortened if we didn't do everything we could to try to change their lifestyle. But most school superintendents, though, would say, this is terrible. 
uh, but they wouldn't be sending their kids a thousand miles away to South Carolina to try and fix that. They'd be saying, um, let's take uh, the soda out of the vending machines, let's change some of the cafeteria options and perhaps bring in a nutritionist. But we've changed all the options, we brought in the nutritionist, we, we've made all those changes we could make a number of years ago. One of the things that I've learned is it's very difficult to judge someone when you don't walk a mile in their shoes. And as we started talking to these families and kids, we realized they needed major environmental changes for a period of time because they were in a rut. They had tried everything they knew how to try and they couldn't change. They were being unsuccessful and still gaining enormous amounts of weight. And so I had to step back to say, you know, I don't understand how they live. I, I don't understand what they're going through, but I have to provide everything I can provide so that they can be successful. And I think that's something that we have to do in education is understand I, I don't walk in their shoes. I, I don't walk in the shoes of those that are in poverty or have major issues with obesity and I have to listen to them and I have to be that conduit to provide to them what they really need. Thirteen students went and as we saw in that report they lost a combined weight of 750 pounds and we see the joy in their faces. Let's take a look at some of these quotes from these students. I lost a hundred pounds. My self-esteem was just through the roof, you know. I'm very proud of you, Jason. I think that it's an amazing thing. So now it's 55 pounds. I'm smiling a lot more and I think I just have more optimism. When I got down to about 250 pounds, I said, wow. She still tells me every day she's happy I'm home. Well, and, and one of the things I told her is I said, I have always told you that you're beautiful. I hope you see it now. I do. We hear about the pride as we hear from some of those um, reports there. But some people would say, God, that was t it cost $28,500 for each of these students for a semester. That's an awful lot of money per student for a district like Independence to be spending. What we did as a school district, uh, we worked with our state department. They allowed us to count these students as if they were in attendance at school. And so we flow through state and federal money that would normally come to us to Mindstream. So that's about $6,000. That's all the school district's on the hook for. The parents have financial commitment into the process as well. And then Mindstream is responsible for uh, fundraising from various foundations and other entities as well. And so the $6,000 that, that we send per student per semester uh, is really insignificant. If you look at the health issues that they're dealing with, and certainly if I can increase their life ex expectancy, um, that's a minimal amount of money. So uh, 28,000 sounds like a lot, but you're only on the hook for 6,000. We're only on the hook for 6,000. Yeah. Now, yeah. of the 13 students, we're in a brand new semester now, and most of them are going back to the camp? Uh, most of them went back. We have a total of 15 students there that are at Mindstream this semester. Now, there must be, though, so many more kids in the independent school district alone who could benefit from this camp. Don't you feel, uh, wow, uh, about all of those kids who could also benefit from this who are not getting this opportunity? You know, two answers to that question. One, uh, we've developed a plan so when these students return, they will be mentors for other students and families as well. Uh, we're working with the families while their students are away at Mindstream so they can make the changes they need to make. And so uh, one of the goals, goals is for these students to return and be mentors to other kids and, and really spread the great, great news and help them in that regard. The second thing is I think we have to, and, and we are diligently looking at how do we make this happen here. Why does it just have to happen in South Carolina? Can't we bring this exactly. to scale here? And you were part of a series that we did just a few years ago on KCPT called Generation XL, where we looked and explored all of these issues. Mm -hmm. Aren't there the resources here in Kansas City, in the metropolitan area, to do the same kind of thing here? We are trying to find those resources currently. We would love to do the same thing right here because we have many more families and students that are in need than we can send to South Carolina. So we, we've been having conversations uh, with individuals in the metro area asking how can we bring a coalition together here to make this happen. Before we leave you, Dr. Hinson, I just want to bring up something that the governor of Missouri brought up uh, this past week when he delivered his State of the State address. And he complained that the state of Missouri had one of the shortest school years in the entire nation. Right now, Missouri has the fourth shortest school year in the nation. Adding six more days to the next school year will give teachers more time to work with their students and give kids more time to learn.
Your reaction to that then, Dr. Henson, a, a longer school year? Uh, everything we do, we try to really look at research and look at hard data to see if it really exists. Uh, I've yet to find anything that says if we extend our school year by six days, I'm going to see a dramatic in increase in student achievement. So the goal might be noble to increase the amount of time kids are at school. I don't disagree with that. Is it going to dramatically increase student achievement? The answer is no. Dr. Jim Henson, head of Independent School District, thank you so much for being with us on The Local Show. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Nick. Recently on The Local Show, we asked, where are the Garmins and the Cerners of the future going to come from? We took you inside the Blue Valley School District's $12 million CAPS building, where the next generation of engineers and life science researchers are getting a head start while still in high school. Believe it or not, students in the CAPS program have also created dozens of businesses and products, everything from rechargeable cell phones to a prosthetic knee brace. When the Chamber of Commerce talks about making Kansas City America's most entrepreneurial city, is this where the next generation will come from? Half of what they teach you and uh, the very first thing they teach you is about professionalism and business and um, they teach you how to market your idea and where to go, how to start, who to talk to, how to basically create your own idea and start your own company. To be able to go from, hey, I think this is a good idea to this is how I'm going to make my idea work and this is who I think can use my product. You would not get that uh, opportunity outside of an environment such as CABS. A year or so ago, we started seeing students create products that were provisionally patentable. Anything from prosthetic arms and trying to make those better, to a better mosquito repellent, to a football helmet that will position a, a spine that has less impact. I always was an idea man, I'm creating ideas and inventions. I actually moved from Texas uh, to CAPS program just because uh, my mom told me about it and it looks really cool so we uh, I moved up here with her and uh, started as soon as I got here uh, working on my idea for the headphones. Uh, we are creating a wireless in-ear sound piece receiver. Uh, it's called Whisper and it's going to be a wireless in-ear headphone. The way that the strands communicate is actually really, really vital to the success of CAPS because if Trey hadn't been able to come down and work with me on this project, I would have never, ever come up with the idea of working on a project such as this and it would have been really difficult for uh, Trey to find yeah, out. I mean, he, he knows all about the, all about the circuit boards and uh, programming and uh, that's not my specialty and so the strands being able to, to uh, communicate is uh, very helpful and allowing us to work together has made all the difference. Uh, we just had an event the other night where uh, we brought in businesses to where the kids from the accelerator pitched all of their ideas to um, local venture capitalists. These students will literally pitch their ideas in front of investors at, who will provide some seed money for them to be able to start building prototypes and proofs of concept of their ideas. So I had some mentors, one specifically, that became an angel investor of one of these kids' businesses. So now that's the next step. It, once a kid has a proof of concept, we have tapped into a whole underworld of entrepreneurs and VCs and angel investors, and it becomes very real very quickly. Project-based learning, I think, is, is really a benefit, especially to the way that, that a lot of prof professionals are working these days. Um, we're finding that companies are trying to become more innovative and more collaborative. And a project-based learning curriculum, I think, really feeds right into that and allows, allows the students to be comfortable in that environment and, and really uh, understand the importance of collaboration. Um, think about the transformation they're going from, from being locked down in their schools um, bind it up really in that hairball, if you will, release of that here and be able to follow that path of their own thinking, their own personal touch, and really have this awakening of, holy cow, I have incredible strengths that I've never discovered. What CAPS really looks to produce is students who will succeed in the business environment instead of um, a lot of high schools looking to produce the students that will succeed in college. CAPS just skips over that and says, we need to produce students who are ready for the real world 
and because they'll have the skills they need for the real world, they'll be fine going through college. And um, an opportunity like that does not happen anywhere else. Rich Miller with that report. Lead funding of KCBT's reporting of education issues is funded in part by a generous grant from the Kauffman Foundation and additional civic funders. And finally this week, for over 25 years, the City in Motion Dance Theater has been developing high quality contemporary dance programming and expanding dance audiences in our metro area. Saturday, City in Motion presents its 10th anniversary production of A Modern Night at the Folly, staged at the historic downtown Folly Theater and featuring the work of local choreographers. Like us on Facebook and you could win a pair of passes on us to this Saturday's big event. I'm Nick Haynes. And I'm Randy Mason. We'll see you next time on The Local Show. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns & McDonnell, with additional financial support from Swope Community Enterprises, and by...